We'll see everyone again on the 26th. My name is Juliet and my partner is Katie. Katie. Um, we have some logistics this first attempt or this first session through. After that, we'll have a mixture of quizzes, group discussions, different types of assessments and opportunities for review. Yeah. So. And just to be clear on like what you're saying, we opened up another session on Mondays just because this one obviously is full and we cannot fit any more people in this room and we couldn't get another room. Um, so we'll be doing like the same session twice a week. So the session have their sessions have like pre-made topics. So that's like the topic that we'll be talking about. Um, just to like see who has already signed up for the second session by a raise of hands. Like if you're already signed up for the session two. You'll be coming more than once. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Has anybody like signed up for specifically section two? Three class, no. No, like like session two, like the Yeah, next... they all did. Okay. They, all did. they did. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, well this isn't working. And then so... seeing that we are reaching people that are at very different points in their teaching careers and testing, there are some logistics that we'll be going through this time that might not seem very deep, such as costs and where to sign up that some of you already know, have already experienced but we will definitely go very deep into content after this session. And that's the reason I asked is because we will dive into the content today a little bit, which will be the next session as well. Um, so basically we wanted to touch on the goals of this program. Um, so it's kind of a common misconception that Ed 302 is supposed to prepare you to take the floor itself. That is not true. Um, that class is to teach you the content of how to obviously teach kids to read. Um, so the goal of this program is to kind of help you more prepare towards the fort. Um, it's not a guarantee that you're going to pass the fort by you being in these sessions, because obviously like there's a part of it that you have to put some commitment into. Um, but I guess the main goal is to just like engage you and really like emerge you into the content um, that you ha may have previously learned or have not started yet to learn um, in a more like engaging way um, that hopefully will obviously get you to pass the fort. Um, we just like to teach it a little different than obviously the school would. <coughs> we want to answer a range of questions behind the logistics so everyone has a sense of comfort of the time, what you can use the whiteboard for, things like that. And then of course also diving deep in and answering other questions. Um, so we are going to dive right in. If you have ever taken this test before, I want you to write down four resources that you use. If you have never taken this test before, write down four places you plan to look for resources. Just do that on a blank piece of paper. You won't be turning this in. This is just a little moment for self reflection. You can additionally write how long you plan to study for or how many weeks slash months you did study. And our hope is that you will add to this current list of resources based on the ones that we also have listed. We'll give you a few more seconds. And like Juliet said, this is kind of just a self-reflection to maybe see um, things that you already have used. And uh, hopefully like this first session especially will give you more res resources that you can use um, going forward. We don't know all of you, but a little bit about us is we both decided to just jump on it, take it right after 302. Um, I wouldn't regret that regardless of the outcome because I still would have had a major sense of comfort knowing where to go, the time, what the sign up process was like, what the results looked like. Um, and so if you're past 302, that's totally fine, but that's just the route that we took. And then yeah, we can't give anyone any homework, but we would appreciate everyone taking the sessions very seriously because we would only do only have an hour with you and you look at the test itself, the test itself is four hours. So thinking about that kind of comparison, you're only required to come to four and the test itself is four hours. So, so with that said, like our expectation from you guys is to please have your phones put away. Um, I know that's really annoying to say um, and that sounds like something a teacher could tell you to do, but um, we just want you guys to get the most out of our sessions, um, and it's just kind of a respectful thing to do. Um, and obviously be engaged in the activities. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to participate at any time. 
Um, and then, yeah, touching off of Juliet, what Juliet said. So yeah, we took the te test for the first time um, after taking 302. That's what is suggested of you. Um, don't feel like you have to take it right away. Everyone goes at their own pace. Um, so don't let anybody hammer it into your head that you have to take it then. Um, but there is a certain time frame that you do have to pass it by and Maggie gives you that um, on your grad plan. Um, so yeah, I guess just what we have on the slide, we both passed on our first try. Um, but with that, we made the test a priority. So we spent a lot of time studying. Um, we made the timeline, we scheduled studying into obviously our busy college lives, stuff like that. We obviously stressed about it. Um, it's a big test, stuff like that. Um, we utilized all of the resources that we had. So we used multiple things, which we'll share with you today. Um, and then a little background to the position. We are paid through the $4.3 million donation that was given. And part of that, a lot of focus of that was literacy. And then going back to literacy, a lot of people we need to reach with the test. Um, so the timeline of that, this has been in the works since December. We accepted the position. And we spent a good chunk of our winter break and we will be spending our spring break right down here to help prepare you guys. So yeah, so just raise your hands. Who has taken the four? Sweet. So that's about half and half, I'd say. Um, so that's good um, because we do have, I guess, like people who have taken it, people who know what it's like and people who don't. So you guys will be able to work together on that. Um, but basically what the test is, um, it's computer-based test that assesses proficiency and understanding of reading and writing content, knowledge, liter literacy development, and instruction. Um, so that's most of the stuff that you do learn in 302, um, but it's like I said, it's not specific towards the test. Um, in Wisconsin, you are required to get a passing score of 240 on the Foundations of Reading test um, for initial licensure. And like I said, you do have a time that you're supposed to pass it by, um, given to you by Maggie, and she sends out pretty frequent emails about that kind of thing. Um, so for UWSP students, obviously it's required that you pass the board prior to graduation. Um, they just changed it from student teaching to graduation this year. Um, if you don't pass it by that time, you can file for an emergency teaching license. Um, and it still allows you to get a teaching job, but your contract has like different stipulations depending on where you get hired. So some of the testing details are also up there, so we won't spend too much time on this. You can register online. You can literally search UWSP Fort, sign up, UWSP, take the Fort or Fort test. There are multiple locations throughout the state. You pay online when you register. It says 139. I believe it comes out to like 155. Um, you pay then and then you register. You can reschedule up to 24 hours in advance. I personally had my first attempt scheduled for August 26th and August 19th was a week before the testing date and I figured there were some type of week policies and I had not looked at the book. So I pushed it back exactly a month. And so if you think you need that extra month, then take that extra month and hold yourself accountable by telling people that surround you that you're taking it so that you're not <laughs> being invited to things. Miss out, miss out a little bit, but get it over with. And then we will also put this presentation on our Canvas site, which um, you should either all be on or we will be adding you to hopefully sometime mm -hmm. soon. I'm not sure on the timeline of that, um, but that's the link for it. And this is exactly what it looks like on the page. Um, so scheduling, yeah, kind of like Juliet said, so you do have to plan in advance. Um, it's suggested that you plan at least three months in advance. You can um, plan further if you'd like, uh, but basically we suggest a minimum of three months just so you have that time to prepare yourself. You definitely don't want to schedule like crazy close to your time because then you don't have enough time to study and really understand the content. Um, if you need to reschedule a test, you have 24 hours in advance. Um, so definitely be aware of that, but definitely don't get into the habit of pushing it back and pushing it back and pushing it back. because that's never good. Um, and then, yeah, you can request a different testing date as long as you meet that deadline. Um, if you don't feel ready, definitely do that. Um, and then Julia already told her story mm -hmm. kind of. And then some of the different weights are also listed up on the board so you can see comprehension, assessment, those are all weighted differently. Types of assessment questions, you'll see 11 to 20 of those versus 35% of the test being on that actual development, which all is all the terms such as phonics, phonemics, alphabetic principle, all of those terms, and then development of comprehension. Those are more questions that will get into grade levels and where the student is at. So a lot of the tests reflecting back is about timeline. So when you're really thinking about skills and different skill levels, not only do we want you to learn and practice and know each of those skills, but we want you to know the timeline. Where is substitution in comparison to deletion? Where is inserting, you know, just kind of all the timelines so you can apply that terminology. Um, so yeah, this is a screenshot up here in the corner from the website. That's how many questions um, are in each section. There's 100 multiple choice questions total, um, but they can give you obviously anything within that range. And then there's two 
short answer questions, which are a running record, and then um, it's, there's one that's about like vocabulary strengths, weaknesses, and like recommendations for a student. And you can flag questions and go back to them at any point. And up until Monday, I had never heard of someone starting with essays. So you can also consider what's best for you. We had someone say they did 50 multiple choice in essay, 50 multiple choice in essay. I personally looked at it no other way than 100 multiple choice, which takes a lot out of you when it, you get to the point where you're like, now I have to produce something. So something to consider your own styles. Yeah, and definitely like with the multiple choice, they are choose the best answer. So there will more than likely be times where you look and there's two answers that are very similar, but there will be like one word that makes a difference. Um, so obviously they will take a lot of time. They will take a lot of effort, like Juliet said. So it's really up to you how you want to go about taking the test. Mm -hmm. So this is just an example of what a question might look like. Um, so you can plan on reading about a paragraph a hundred times. That's something serious to know, four hours. So, I mean, this is a shorter question. There's nothing about grade level. There's nothing about that but we're taking a term, phonological awareness. So which type of student is demonstrating the specific type known as phonemic awareness? So in this question alone, before I look at the answers, I need to know two things. I need to know phonological awareness. I need to know phonemic awareness. I need to know how those are connected and I need to know which type. And that's, that's, no, that's the first question on the practice one. So we wanna be able to look at these 100 practice questions or however many we have included and break those completely apart. So this one is saying, ring, sing, fling, hang, so NG, there's a name for that. You know, all those different things is what we'll really get into. Um, terms to keep an eye out for, I think it's the next one. Um, I looked through some testing logistics on the practice test, which is, is very similar to the overall test, and was kind of surprised to see some of these things. I counted all of the times that these specific words appeared. I did not look at every one, but my biggest takeaway that you should know for this is the word grade is used 78 times. So that is a timeline, 78 different times. That's not saying 78 questions, sometimes grade was in the answer, but you can definitely plan on a majority of these questions being like a fifth grade student is blank, or the student at this grade blank. So it's a lot, a lot of application of those terminologies. And digraph, of course, you don't wanna get any wrong if you have the choice, but that's on there once, you know, and that's something we spend time on. So kind of consider the weights of these things. If you have something over that's really concerning to you, like phonics, phonemic awareness, that just can't, like <laughs> they're not meeting together. Um, you can consider comprehension, vocabulary, those foundations of development, 35% versus sight words six times. So a lot of applying to scenarios and a lot, a lot of, yes, applying to scenarios, activities, and connecting those vocab words. So I thought that was interesting. So yeah, a little bit about during the test. So um, obviously, like we said, when you sign up, you can choose whatever testing center you want to go to. They're all over the state. Um, there is, I think there's two in Stevens Point. One is on campus in Dalzell Hall um, in the testing center there. Um, but when you go there, this picture is very similar to what it looks like. So a lot of people don't know what it's like taking the test when they go into the test, which causes a lot of anxiety and which may be um, part of the reason that they may not do so well. Um, so we wanted to give you guys that visual right away and kind of tell you like about our experiences. Um, so basically you go into a room similar to that one. Um, the test is on a computer. You get a white bar, a whiteboard and a marker um, to write any notes down, um, anything like that. You can use it for whatever. Um, and then you can take one 15 minute break um, during the test to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water. Um, you're placed in the cubicle and there might be other people in the same room as well. So they could be taking um, other tests. Um, they try to strategically like seat you so you're not right next to somebody, um, but that may not be the case in some situations. Um, yeah, it's administered through a computer. Um, and then there's one question per slide. So uh, there will never be more than one question on the screen when you're taking the test. Um, you can go back to any questions at any time. Um, unanswered questions get flagged. So uh, you can flag a question and then go all the way to the end. And then when you hit submit, it won't let you submit it because the answer is flagged. Um, so you'll never submit anything that you didn't complete. So just plan for a very sterile environment where you'll have yourself. I walked in, I had my water bottle, they said no, something like that. So you have yourself. Yep. I didn't take the break, but I don't. And each that. testing site does it differently, how they obviously like get you into the room and stuff. Um, but after you take the test, your, result, your results are posted um, like six to eight weeks after your test date. You can check what date you're going to get that on. Um, um, after you schedule your exam, you'll see like score report dates. They'll give you a range. If you took it between that range, it'll tell you the date you get them. 
I got mine on that day at like 9 p.m. So it was pretty late. I had to wait a while. I don't know about yep. you if it was similar, but it's definitely you're, you'll have to wait for your. Um, yep. And so. then if you are getting close to that graduation point, you just took it, you're not quite sure how you feel, you can retake it 30 days after, which will be around the exact same time that you'll get results. Um, so then before your testing date, obviously utilize any and every resource that is available to you. The more resources you use, the more perspective and the better learning experiences and knowledge you'll have. Um, I've heard Maggie tell stories about people that come in and cry because they've paid $600 to take the test, you know, four times. Um, but they didn't, they used three resources and that's all they used. So they didn't use everything that was provided. So she said tough luck and kind of pushed them on to use different things. And that's exactly what she'll do for you guys too. So we want you to utilize everything that you can. Um, this is a resource, so you're in luck. It's really easy for you guys. It's provided for you, and it's not too much of a commitment. Going off of plan to study 10 hours a week, think about those times during your day that are down times. You're driving. You're getting ready. You're in the grocery store. You can have headphones in. You can be listening to a YouTube video. Think of all those times to add that up. If you're in the EMB, if you're a student teaching student, if you're already teaching, where are you going to find those 10 hours? Well, 10 minutes a night, 10 days, in a, you know, some, it adds up. So think about those downtimes you have. I personally listen to it every single car ride for a week. And when I left the test, part of my celebration was listening to music on the way home. So <laughs> think about those times that you have that you don't always think that you have. Exactly. So yeah, I guess with my experience too, um, I make flashcards as a study resource and I would bring them with me when I go like to like sports practice or if I went out with friends, I'd bring them with me and I'd go through them when I wasn't like involved in any conversation of some sort. Um, I looked ridiculous, but it helped me pass, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and then as you'll always be told, get a good night's rest and eat a good breakfast. It will seriously help you. It's four hours long, so if you don't eat, you're gonna be so hungry and that's all you're gonna think about. So, um, and if you're tired, you're obviously gonna be like, this sucks and we don't want you to have that mindset going in. We want you to obviously wake up happy and full and everyone's happier when they're not hungry, so. Yeah. Because the timeline that you take the test is vary on you and individual, be consistent, hold yourself accountable, make reminders in your phone, write it down in your planner, keep yourself engaged by looking at multiple resources, even the practice test alone, that's 100 paragraphs, that's boring. Well, we have quizlets, you can take little things jumping across the screen and try to type in comprehension. The next day, you only have, you're driving to practicum 20 minutes away or so. Well, YouTube, and that's, that's good. You're keeping yourself exposed but do that consistently every day and you'll continue to make those connections and be ready. The best suggestion that I have would be to schedule time. Um, so every day in your planner, write down, study for four at 5 p.m. if you have nothing going on. I um, mean, holding yourself to that. It's just like going to the gym. I hate going to the gym and I write it in my schedule every day and I never want to go when I write it, but I always go because it makes me happy and it keeps me healthy. So something like that, um, consistency. So this is a generalist, so you guys can take a picture of this. In addition to that, one of the best ones, though, that I wrote up there was Wendy Gustavo's 120 question Quizlet set. So either that name or like a picture of this. It will be all shared with you also, though. So totally up to you. Yeah, you'll have access to this PowerPoint, too. So don't feel like you have to take a picture if you don't want to. Yeah. And then we have one more slide, quite a few more. Um, so we can talk about our personal favorites for a little bit as well. So if you've taken 302, you've probably had to buy the book. Absolutely not. Um, it's by, obviously, Cindy Kate and Dr. Fernholz as well. Um, so you'll have that book. It has practice questions in it, um, all of the content that you'll need to know, um, how Dr. Kate teaches it. It's $78 on Amazon if you don't have it. Um, we do have books that you can check out. Um, so, But all of the practice questions in those will probably be answered and already filled out, so that probably wouldn't help too much. But for the content, it would. You can take notes off of. Um, and then the Jaeger Guide as well. I don't think that they give that out anymore for 302. Um, but it's available online. There's a PDF version. Oh, so it's, it should be, that table has one and that table has one. It's really, really long, so you probably won't want Super to passive. print it off. But it does have everything related to the fort um, in the fort terms, which is really helpful. Very vocab inclusive. Wendy Gustavo's 120 question quizlet also is, it's not just terminology, it's kind of more paragraph form. So, first um, So, yeah, so we did have access to Wendy Gustavo's videos on YouTube, which we both used to study. Um, and I mean, obviously, like, that was a really big resource for us, but she did take them down, um, which was very unfortunate. We put this in our presentation two days later, she took them down. 
Um, but for some reason, if they happen to come up again, we have them here. Uh, we're going to try to gain access to them somehow. We think that maybe the situation would be she is starting to charge for them because she realized how many people are using them because it did have a lot of views on YouTube. Was, so <laughs> It was over an hour each, and every time that I watched one, I had about 10 pages of notes, and that was pretty much all the studying I did for that day. Leading up to the week before, I watched each video three times, and that in itself was 12 hours or so. Um, and then they blew up. And now she's making a profit. So there's a conversation that will be had about how we can possibly use <laughs> funds from here to access those. Um, but yeah, and obviously, like all of our sessions will be posted on the TLC Tutor YouTube page. So if you want to reuse what we have said to you, those will be accessible as well. Um, obviously, the Madison Foundations of Reading modules, those are free. Um, online as well. Um, flashcards, we ask you that maybe moving forward when we're diving deeper into content, you bring some flashcards to our sessions because you can write vocab down as we go through. Um, that is the pretty much the most beneficial if you can, if you're a person that can look at a vocab word and memorize it um, and then eventually get to the point where you can memorize it into context, um, those are very effective. I memorized my flashcards front and back and I had like 120 something of them and that really helped me on the test because as soon as I saw the word, I thought of the card and then I knew exactly what the definition was and then I put it into context in the question. Um, plan to afford our fort, our fort, uh, what? Plan to attend our fort workshops every other Wednesday um, or Monday now um, until the end of the year and you can stop in for individual tutoring. Um, right now we have it set up so it would be a weekly commitment but if you don't want to commit to something weekly or if your schedule doesn't permit that we can discuss maybe um, signing you up for just a week if you feel like you need it. Um, but we do ask that, like, do take advantage of both of them because the stuff we talk about in the workshops is obviously very specific and we're not going to change all of the things that we're presenting for just one person. So if you feel like you need extra help in a certain area, um, or even if you just want to get extra help and dive a little deeper than maybe we did in the workshops, that's a great resource for you. Um, and then other resources can be found on the UWSP page. You can also just type in UWSP Foundations Reading Test. It'll bring you to a really long page of resources. Um, and then this is considered the holy grail. So this is uh, the practice test um, on the Foundations of Reading Test site. Um, so this is really helpful. I'm not going to open it up and take a look at it um, yet, but it's really helpful because it has the 100 questions and it has two of the writing prompts examples. So what I did with this was when I was studying for the test, I'd take one section one day and then grade it. And then I'd take the second session the next day and grade it. And then the third section, and then I take the whole test and I grade myself. Um, and grading myself really gave me an idea of where I was at. So up to the test, if I had a score that was like 140, I knew obviously that I either needed to study more, I needed to push my test back, stuff like that. Um, it's very long and it does take a lot of time. It probably took me like six hours a day to take the whole thing um, and grade it. So, but that's available to you. It's a really good resource and it helps you decide why the answers are correct, why they're incorrect, um, all that kind of stuff. And going off of the practice test and the practice test appendix, which has paragraph answers of why A, C, and D are incorrect and why B is correct. Expose yourself to resources se sequentially. Start small because if you are looking at vocabulary words, you're getting that terminology down, that's great. But if you look at this, paragraph and you can say I know why it's not B and I know why it's A that's awesome but I don't that doesn't mean that you know exactly the terminology you might know that question and you might read this whole question and say I get it I know how to answer this question and that's very true but it's about transforming starting small that vocab and applying it to so many situations which you can get into on that practice test when you are yeah and with that too the practice test there are some questions that are on the fort um, itself so if you go through and do it enough, you'll eventually like recognize the question when you're taking a test and you'll be like, I answered that on the practice test. But not every question is. Obviously, they would not do that. Um, so yeah, like Juliet said, you definitely have to know the content before you even start to practice because if you rely on memorizing the answers to those questions, you probably will not do good. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we kind of touched on this. So the test benefits you, obviously, because you consider all the following. So why the correct answer is correct why the incorrect answers are incorrect, what the question's asking, what information is needed, um, information within the question, such as like gender, grade, specific setting. Um, the appendix goes through that. And then she already mentioned about the grade. There are also a certain questions where you'll approach it and it'll say an English language learner is something. 
and right now you're thinking English language learners, English language learners, maybe you've never even worked with them. What they're really hinting at is someone that's early in their phase of phonological awareness. So you can always revert back to that timeline that you create. A fifth grade student is at the highest level of comprehension. Fifth grade, okay, good, but what's the highest level of comprehension? If you know that, you can apply that to both those questions. Um, and obviously, like we'll dive deeper, we will look into effective ways to analyze questions in another workshop that will more, more than likely be a workshop itself because that's very important. Um, so we just have a little kahoot quickly that we're going to do um, to kind of test your knowledge on the information that we just did. And then after that, we will be diving into phonological awareness. So, fun things. I don't know if we're on like, like the Kahoot music, some people really love to it, but some don't. Um, so you just want to give me a thumbs up when you're in so I can... times as it takes to pass so there has been like uh, <laughs> some people think it's at nine um, some people think it's at ten but there's actually like no research on it um, there's nothing on their website that says you can't take it um, as much as you want there's nothing that limits it so obviously when you get to like time eight or nine that's when you really gotta like reevaluate um, and rethink about that you can take it after you pass too mm -hmm. so our bosses retook it to talk to us about it Less than. <laughs> what is the cost? All right, yeah, so it's one thirty nine. So with tax, it'd be around one fifty. <laughs> But the cost of the test itself is 139. So true or false, you have to pass the court with at least a 240. Okay, it's frozen. Ooh, skip. Okay, so true, you have to pass with a, at least a 240. All right, you can reschedule a test at no cost if All right, yeah, you meet the 24 hour deadline. So if you don't, um, you'll be out some money. <laughs> Best way to study for the court is Great, that's good to see. So yeah, using a variety of resources, there's not one resource that will benefit you more than another. 
You have to pass the four in order to graduate on time. Two or false. All right, so that one is false. You can graduate without passing the four. You just uh, have to file for an emergency license, and you will have stipulations on your contract. So it won't affect you graduating, um, but the goal is to pass it by graduation. Mm -hmm. Definitely set that bar for yourself. How many questions is the fourth? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, you signed up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Okay, so really it's 102, there's 100 multiple choice, and then two open response. So technically you're right if you guess 100 because that's how many question questions there are. Sorry if we were in any streets. <laughs> so you have to answer the questions in order when taking the fort. True or false? Good. Jump all around. All right, which of these concepts is on the fort? All right, so that was a trick question. All of them are, so whatever you answered is correct. All right, last question. What type of questions are on the fort? Okay, yeah, so all of those types of questions are on the board. All right. Okay, great job. Um, all right, so are there any questions specific to like testing logistics? Anything? I just have one question. Sure. Is this a United States test? I mean, or as far as I know, it's yeah, state, it's state specific. It's not yeah. every state, no. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, not every state you have to pass the four, or sometimes their passing mm -hmm. score is different than like Wisconsin would be. So Wisconsin has a pretty high passing score, but like with every test, like the Praxis, there's different requirements for different states for you to teach there. Okay, okay. so it's not the same test for every state. Like Wisconsin develops their own. So in Massachusetts, it's called the MPEL, okay. for example. And I, like, Dr. Kate. Um, mentioned my semester, you can use that. So it's a variation of the same testing takers because Pearson is nationwide. Mm -hmm. And then the specific state goes off of their teaching license requirements. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of reading tests, if you're going in and taking a standardized reading test, it might be called the MPEL, um, but Fort is Wisconsin specific. Um, but Katie's parents live in Indiana. She goes to Indiana. She will be I'll have to take like both, both of the practice. praxis tests because they're required in that state. But here they got rid of them unless mm -hmm. you don't have like a high enough GPA kind of thing. Yeah. So if you have like a three point seven five or above, you don't have to take the like subject praxis one. Um, if you're thinking you're teaching in a state that it doesn't, that's really low. Yeah. If you're thinking you're teaching in a test that it's in a state that it's not required in, then. I mean, you'll still graduate, everything like that, but it'll give you that freedom and flexibility if you ever want to move back to this yeah. four season state. So it's different for like each person. <laughs> Any other questions? Do the questions change? For, like, does everyone have different questions on the floor? Or is it the same? Um, that I couldn't tell you the direct answer to, but they would definitely be in a different order. So I don't think that you'd take the test a second time and it'd be like the same questions in the same order. So you couldn't like go on memorizing yeah. them or anything like so, that. So yes, it's a pool of similar variation questions. So like how they said 31, 20, 31 to 20 to 31 questions specifically on foundations of reading development, those would be pulled from a pool written by Pearson. Um, so those would be different, but they'd be from a pool of the same concepts. And someone might have 22 on their test, and the next person might have a little extra of the comprehension section, but it would wait out for the approximate percentages. I just want to quick say something. So when I went to my test, I was not allowed to wear like any jewelry, and the person in front of me had like a little headband on, and she wasn't allowed to wear it. So don't go there looking all pretty. And stuff. Like, <laughs> Definitely wear sweatpants and a sweatshirt and be yeah. comfortable. <laughs> and like make sure you don't have pockets either, because they'll make you. They check you for everything. Yeah, and they're pretty strict about being on your phone too. You're not necessarily supposed to be on your phone before. Like in um, the building upstairs. Yeah. Like when you get to the center upstairs. I took it at MTC in Wausau. And yeah. You just had to be there within the 15 minutes and you lock all your stuff up in a locker. Yeah. You yep. lock, you lock everything up. Yep. Yeah. I was just going to say it also gets very hot. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. it, so. yeah, it was really warm in there. Um, and I mean, like everyone's testing experience is different, obviously, mm-hmm. depending on the location. Uh, Sean? So when you get your mm-hmm. results back, is it just like saying like the number, like the specific number you got, or is it like... It's a very, that? very detailed report. Your so results. it'll tell you what you got in each section, okay. um, all of the like scale Check scores. Yeah. It'll tell you like pass or fail at the top. Um, Maybe one of the Helpful sessions, I was going to say, we can show one of our score reports. And it's infinitely accessible. So is that. it reported, like, to the state that you Yeah, so you select, you get it to UW. yeah, so you select, like, what state you want to send it to, what institution, and then they'll also send it to your email. So, like, with me, I printed, like, five copies of mine, just in case I ever lost one, and, like, for some reason it didn't get sent somewhere. Um, and you can send them to like different states as well. It just depends. They'll ask you all of that when you sign up for the test okay. too. That was a good question. Any other questions? All right, keep on going. Uh, we'll go back to the score report as soon as she's ready. Um, so, but for now, uh, we're gonna start diving into the specifics. Um, so this would technically be session two, but we do want to kind of hammer through this section. This is the most basic section. Um, it's on phonological and phonemic awareness. Um, so phonological awareness is the awareness that oral language is composed of smaller units such as words and syllables. Um, so a student who has developed phonological awareness may be able to recognize that spoken words can be divided into syllables. Um, so we all know what a syllable is. Um, and you can like clap or count the number of syllables in the word. Um, and phonological awareness instruction <laughs> is instruction that deals with helping students identify the sounds, specifically the sounds in spoken words. Something that was very helpful when thinking about phonological awareness is you can do it with the lights off, you can do it without a pencil, you, you don't need anything, you need your ears. So when you get into phonics, which not to overwhelm, we will get into that. But that's something that you can't do with the lights off. You can't do, you can do with your eyes closed. So write that down, with the lights off. Final logical is with the lights off. So you don't have to see, all you need is your ears. Nothing to do with letters, it's what to do with sound. Um, so yeah, you're being able to identify and manipulate sounds in words, syllables, and phonemes. Um, so at your table, if you could share an example, and then we will have four people share out what their example is of phonological awareness. We'll give you like two minutes. So a way that you can manipulate a word with the lights off. So if you think rhyming, tell your neighbor a rhyme. Good to know. I don't know why you say that. So like, what do you think of like when you're thinking thinking of a word? You do beginning letters. Like on that line. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like you were like the substitution, whatever that's funny. I think that's all the different Yeah. I get so it's like phonological awareness is like a different word, and then it like goes to the same and then you know like you know. Related. Yeah. Is like putting it under. All right. So if we can finish up our stuff. And then I need four volunteers. Okay, Kelly. Syllable. Syllable. Yeah, that's phonological awareness. So, how many syllables are in your name would be a good example or an example of something. So, Juliet. That's phonological. Lights can be off. I'm thinking about a part of a word, an individual sound. All right, let's get at least two more. Kayla, I know you're thinking of one. I said frog and dog. Frog and dog. So, like rhyming. Yeah, that's what I was said. Doing. Rhyming. Okay. Does anybody have something different? No? Taking the word cat and saying cut. A substitution. Mm-hmm. On set and rhyme. I like that. We'll learn about that as well. All right. So phonological awareness is an umbrella term. Um, as soon as I saw this, I've never seen this before. I started like training for this job. This has been the most helpful thing to like get me to understand it. So the umbrella um, is phonological awareness. Um, we have umbrellas on your table. If you don't have one, we have extra copies. Um, so if you would write in the blank umbrella, write phonological awareness. Do you need one? 
And this can be brought with you to future sessions to answer questions such as someone has reached the furthest level of phonemic awareness, what are they at? Um, yeah, don't copy anything under the umbrella yet. Oh. Just write phonological awareness. Yep. Inside it. <laughs> yep, just inside the I didn't do it on mine because I'm a really bad teacher, but um, <laughs> yeah, do it on yours. All right, so in your groups, um, if you have any prior knowledge, use your prior knowledge uh, to kind of construct your umbrella. So think of like words that would go under the umbrella. You don't have to put them in order. Um, you don't have to even put them on your umbrella. You could write them on a separate sheet of paper. Um, you do have a word bank too. So try to maybe construct them in the order that it would be in the umbrella. The umbrella goes left to right. So it goes in order of what a student would learn first and then what mastery of phonological awareness would be. So not everything on this word blank is would be under the umbrella either. Like so, here. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 so the first one is So if I say the word cat. So if you don't have any, that might have been a really bad activity, but this is our first time doing this. Um, you can just copy it. Copy it on. <laughs> copy it and use it as a resource. Yeah. And you'll obviously, like, we're not just going to let you copy it and not teach you about it. You'll uh, provide examples by each thing. Um, so just to touch a little bit on what I meant by left to right. So a student is first going to become, like, aware of their words. So they're going to master word awareness first. They're going to learn rhyme and alliteration. Then the next step of phonological awareness is syllable awareness. Um, and those are just some examples. And then they'll learn onset and rhyme. And then they'll move on to phonemic awareness, which has several different levels. So the, um, I guess the highest level of phonemic awareness is substitution, which we'll learn about. Um, so it does go left to right um, and kind of down the list. And um, the timeline, if that helps you to make an arrow from left to right. And I know you're writing, you don't even have to listen to me if, that, if that's confusing <laughs> or if you just are a writer. Um, going back to our definition of phonological awareness. That is considering single sounds, hearing sounds, manipulating sounds. These are the ways that we'll be defining that you can do that. So each of these will be defined. Like I said, if you are just writing, that's totally fine. But under that phonological awareness umbrella, the student's aware of words. In a sentence, they can count how many words are in a sentence. That's an example of phonological awareness. That's the first one. Word awareness, cat, pat, mat, they can recognize those are all words and there's a similar sound in them. Alliteration, Timmy tickled Tammy. <laughs> so nice. Um, they can hear that. This is all with the lights off though, so they can count how many words are in a sentence. Hey, those words rhyme. Hey, those words start with the same sound. Going to the next one, syllable awareness. Within those words, I can kind of separate those with the way that they sound. I can take that word, Juliet, and not only can I rhyme it or can I tell that that's a sound, I can take it and separate it into those individual sounds. So I'm not yet considering the way those sounds work. I'm not considering how it starts, how it ends specifically, but I'm breaking it into those individual sounds. Onset and rhyme awareness, they again, they don't actually know what the letters are like. We're not into letters. This is the lights are off. You can take a word such as blend and you can say that first sound is bl and the end sound is end. So we'll be going further into that. Um, and a consonant digraph like our things are sounding, two sounds can come together. And then phonemic awareness, we'll break each of these down too. But isolation, I can say a word, hi, and I can ask a student, what did that start with? What was that first sound? And they can say, so they can take that word and they can repeat something. Identity, again, that's the sounds of words with them sounding similar. Categorization, short words, big words, words starting with the same letter. They can begin in their minds, because again, lights are off. In their minds, they can begin to make to sort them. Blending. They can take two sounds and they can 
or three sounds and they can bring them together like in blending. They could repeat that back to me and they're making a full sound. Segmenting. They like can, segmenting the different sounds within the yeah. word. Yeah, so similar to syllables, they can take those words and kind of break them apart into beginning and end or beginning and ending, such as ing. Um, deletion, I can say, look at all those dogs. And then I can say, what would that sound like if I took off the S? Look at all those dog. Or, so deletion, we can take something off. Addition, you can add something on. Look at that dog. Look at those dogs. You can add on a letter. You can say, hey, what would, what would cat sound like with an S at the end? And you can add cats. And then the last one, substitution. In a student's mind so far, we've said, I can hear a word. I can tell that word ends with the same sound. I can tell that word starts with the same sound. I can take off something, I can put something on. But the hardest one in the timeline is going to be taking a sound and asking them to change it by substituting something else. So taking cat, they're hearing cat, they know cat. They know nothing about what a U is, but you can say, now say cut. Like, so you substituting is the furthest level. So that's kind of an overview. I know most of you are writing, so it's totally fine if you tune that out, um, but a little more explaining there. And it looks like most people are finishing up. Um, we'll definitely come back to the umbrella. It's not going to be the last time you'll see it. I'll promise you that. Um, but we're basically just going to dive right into the umbrella and provide ourselves with some examples. So it's not just a big blurb of words that we don't know. Um, so it's a hierarchy from basic to more complex. So I kind of went through this out already. It goes left to right, um, basic to more complex. Um, it goes word awareness, syllable awareness, onset rhyme awareness, and then phonemic awareness in that order. So just don't forget that. Um, so if there's a question on the fort, for example, that says, um, a student, a has, student reached has reached the highest level of phonological awareness, um, they can substitute, they know onset and rhyme, they can isolate or they have awareness of rhyme and alliteration. The answer would be substitution because that is on the very right side at the very bottom. So remembering that order and there will be questions like that um, very frequently on the court. Yep. So not only remembering that order, but ruling out things right away. A student that that's, a, that's at the furthest level of phonological awareness, they're probably not identifying a word. You can tell yourself and then you can think back, okay, that's on, that's early, that's on the left. So. Not only can it help you rule things out, but it can help you confirm why your right answer is right. Well, if it's not a vocab word under your umbrella too, then it has nothing to do with phonological awareness. So why would that be the answer? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the umbrella. So phonological awareness overall is a broad term that includes phonemic awareness. In addition to phonemes, phonological awareness activities can involve work with rhymes, words, syllables, onset and rhymes. So Question for you guys, what will a student master first, phonemic awareness or phonological awareness? Or is one them? part of the other? Who well, can answer the question? Cassie, I saw you say the answer. Well, yeah, phonemic. So yeah, so a student would master phonemic awareness before mastering phonological awareness as a whole, if that makes sense. So you gotta know the parts to know the whole thing. But one is part of the other, yeah. So the basic types of tasks, and most of these questions will relate to kindergartners or younger students on the test, are the ability to hear rhymes and alliteration. We talked about dog, fog, six snakes, self sodas, that's an example of alliteration. Assonance, assonance is hearing the middle sound of words, recognizing leaf, bean, peach, reach. It's not called a rhyme, it's not called anything else. What's left? Assonance. Um, so oddity tasks, I tell you a list of words, cat, mat, sat, bit. Which one doesn't belong? Bit. Which one does not start with the same sound? Similarly, a sentence. Which has a different middle sound? Cat, mat, sat, cut. So that's an oddity test. So these are examples of questions that if you see them on the test, you have a student rhyming. You have a student ask which word does not belong. You give the student words sing, fling, ting. If we're hearing things, we can automatically think phonological. So you can keep going. There's three more. Ability to blend words, so taking syllables, table, putting them together, onset and rhyme, listen to the word part, say the word part. So I say, what does at mean? And they say sat, ability to segment words, syllables, Juliet, 
on set and rhyme, stop, st, uh, phoneme by phoneme, ju, j, u, u, e, et. So all those things you can do with the lights off, and there's one more phonological task, phoneme manipulation. So taking an initial sound, substituting it, vowel substitution, taking something off, dogs to dog, initial phoneme and a blend deletion, final phoneme and a blend deletion, and second phoneme and a blend deletion. And I know we're not into phonemes yet, but all things that you can consider in terms of phonological awareness tasks. So if they're talking on the test about syllables, or they're talking about rhyming, or substituting, or blending, in an oral perspective, you can think, can I turn the lights off and still do this? And then you can think, okay, phonological awareness, and break those words apart. So. All right, so the first section, um, now we're going to dive into the individual parts. So the breaking part, the umbrella part. Yeah, so the first part is word awareness. So that's your first step to phonological awareness. Um, so we're going to define the terms under there. You put rhyme and alliteration. So rhyme is the correspondence of a sound between words or the ending of words, especially when they are used at the end of like lines of poetry. Um, there, it often uses the rhyme of the word. So we'll learn um, what onset and rhyme is, and the rhyme is the second part of the word. Um, so an example, like Juliet has said before, is cat, pat, mat. Um, so that's probably a familiar term that you've heard before that you've probably used, um, but this is like the definition, obviously, that you'll have to apply. Um, and then alliteration is the occurrence of the same letter or sound at the beginning of an adjacent or closely connected word. So when we're thinking of like keeping the lights off, alliteration, you would hear the sound. So like Tammy tickles Tommy or Tommy tickles Tammy, whatever I have the first time, the t sound is um, alliteration. Another component of word awareness can be as simple as identifying how many words are in a sentence. Usually the test won't go to that level of simplicity and say, this student can say there are five words in a sentence because we just know right away they're telling us that and they kind of like to trick you. But that is something to know. Word awareness can be as simple as hearing a word as a separate unit of speech. So then as we're moving along the umbrella too, you'll kind of be able to mentally align it with a grade level. Um, so this is the most basic um, side of like phonological awareness. So this would be typically like the younger mm -hmm. ages. Syllable awareness, a word part that contains a vowel in spoken language or a vowel. So it doesn't necessarily matter that they know what that sound is, that they can manipulate that sound yet. None of that. They just can hear that there are different pauses in between the sounds in a word. I'm going to go back to my name, Juliet. They know it takes more than just one cat for that. They know it's taking Juliet. We're not focusing yet on that that starts with a J or that the T is a T. None of that. We're just saying that word sounds different at different parts. I can break it apart and that's a way that they can identify it. So again, this is an earlier task for students. My question on the fort might be something like a student can clap um, out the syllables of alphabet. Um, what level of phonological awareness is the student demonstrating? Um, then you know syllable awareness, stuff like that. Um, something similar along those lines. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously like a strategy to teaching that type of awareness is clapping out, how to do that. Um, but breaking down into onset and rhyme awareness. So onset and rhyme are parts of spoken language that are smaller than syllables, but larger than phonemes. So that's gonna be a really important part of the definition is knowing that they are smaller than syllables, but larger than phonemes. Um, and onset is the initial consonant sound of a syllable. A rhyme is the part of a syllable that contains the vowel and all that follows it. So in stop, the onset is st, and the rhyme is op. So stop. Um, so breaking it down into simpler terms, onset is the first letters before the vowel in the word, and the rhyme is the last part of the word. So common misconception is it's easy to confuse this with syllables, but in a word like vowel, the entire onset is because we have a vowel right away. I know it's confusing to use the word vowel for vowel. I use word. Word, the onset for word is woo, like the woo sound. <laughs> um, everything after that, you got that first vowel, you're into the ending, and the ending is the rhyme. Are there any questions thus far about everything that we've gone over? It's 7.30, so I figured. Not yet, keep going. <laughs>
Okay, oh, this is a good activity. So which no, part no. of the word sport <laughs> is, uh, oh, whoa. Which part of the word <laughs> sport is the onset and which is the run? So who can tell me the onset of sport? Oh, that's cool. Sp, yeah, sp. So what is the rhyme? Or, or, or. or. So sp or. Good job. <laughs> so S B or P is the onset and or is the rhyme. Um, so in one syllable word, the onset is the first letter, like Juliet was saying, and the rhyme is the last part of the word. So the rhyme is the vowel and everything after that. So a vowel will not be a part of the onset. And this is a prime example. This is a prime example. So you think of a word like joke, and you're like, joke, one syllable. I hear one sound. Not in this case. We have j and oak because we have a syllable in this terms of rhyme. So 